Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're listening in from today. My name is Ryan O'Donnell and I'm a Divisional Director with Informa Middle East based in Dubai. Informa are delighted to join forces with the Balanced Scorecard Institute USA to bring you this webinar in strategy, execution, and innovation. This webinar and its questions are being recorded today and the slides, audio, and questions will be, be available 24 hours after the completion of this webinar. We have allocated time at the end of the webinar to answer questions that will be submitted throughout the webcast. So please do take the opportunity to use the built-in question functionality throughout the presentation. Inform the Middle East have an ongoing strategic partnership and together with other com offer conferences, training courses and webinars to participants like you with the Balanced Scorecard Institute. This webinar is being held in conjunction with and in the lead up to our annual strategy execution and innovation forum being held in Dubai from the 7th to the 10th of May. Webinar participants and registrants will be provided with an exclusive 20% discount off the cost of the entire conference registration. The final slide in today's presentation will provide you with a special discount code and all of the information you require to register your attendance. If you like what you hear today, please do join us in the next month in Dubai to meet both of today's presenters in person. I'd like to now hand over to Balanced Scorecard Institute President and CEO, Howard Rom, and Vice President of International Operations and Senior Consultant, Joe DiCarlo. Howard and Joe will now take over to take you through today's webinar on strategy execution and innovation. I do hope you enjoyed today's broadcast, and please do to remember any questions you have as we proceed throughout the webinar. We will endeavor to answer as many of them as possible. Thank you very much for taking part today, and over to you, Howard. Thank you, and uh, good day to everybody. <clears throat> um, I uh, have been doing this for a long time, and uh, both in the government and uh, private sector and uh, nonprofit sector. And so what I want to do is uh, share stories with you today about uh, what we have learned about combining strategy execution and uh, innovation. And I'm joined today by, um, by Joe DiCarlo. Uh, Joe, you want to? Say a few words. Sure. Good morning, Howard, and good morning to the attendees for this webinar. It's a, it's an exciting webinar to be on for me because uh, when we talk about innovation, uh, I spent about 25 years with the IBM Corporation, starting back when there weren't any PCs, there weren't any internet, and uh, storage. A big deal about storage was 10 meg, and uh, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of a full circle uh, in my experiences uh, in this innovation area, Howard. Very good. We've come a long way, haven't we? We have, certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, some topics today. How do these two uh, topics fit together? Uh, turns out there's different ways of uh, looking at it. Uh, for those of you who are um, strategic uh, planners or thinkers, strategy management practitioners, and have uh, read any of uh, Minsberg's work on strategy, he talks about uh, different schools of strategy. There's there's different schools of innovation uh, that uh, we, we have seen as process, as culture, and as standalone strategy. So we'll want to share what, uh, what we've learned in, uh, in, uh, in that area. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about how you measure strategy and innovation. Uh, Joe and I will both be doing workshops at the um, conference that uh, Ryan mentioned on um, balance scorecard, advanced balance scorecard, and uh, measuring strategy and innovation. Uh, so if you're interested in that, we'll uh, share some more details at the end of the presentation. And then we'll, uh, we'll close with a little bit about innovation management. I'd like to start with a little bit of context. Uh, we think of three phases <clears throat> for high-performing organizations. Um, at the highest level, you know, at high altitude, you have to have a process where you formulate your strategy. You have results from the assessment, internal and external assessments. You have scenario planning. Uh, you have SWOT analysis, PESTLE analysis. There's a lot of tools that we can use to help refine and get to uh, a few strategies uh, for, for an organization to, uh, uh, to uh, proceed with. Um, aligning the organization is also a high-level <clears throat> phase where we want to become strategy-focused and move strategy uh, into operations and into uh, uh, aligning employees and the processes and the technology that they use to to the organization's strategy. <clears throat> and then strategy execution uh, is acting on strategy, strategy implementation. So we tend to think of those as three connected uh, links. 
Um, for those of you who are uh, in this uh, business, have been for a while, you realize that uh, there's not universal truth around the world as to what these words mean. Uh, different folks have different definitions, so I thought I'd start uh, with the ones that we use, so that we're all on the um, we're all on the same page for the rest of the presentation. So we look at strategy execution as a combination of leading and communicating and managing in a climate of teamwork, continuous improvement, and change. Uh, and we think of innovation as ideation, uh, evaluation, selection, development, and implementation of new or improved product services programs, and also the processes that we use to produce those. <clears throat> so with those two uh, uh, definitions in mind, we'll uh, proceed through the, uh, through the rest of the presentation. Uh, we also think about two types of innovation, the breakthrough innovation, where we come up with uh, brand new uh, ideas, new products, new ways of doing things, and <clears throat> the sustaining uh, innovation, where we're continuously improving uh, processes, for example, to improve workflow and uh, production lines. So let's start with the first topic, how to strategy and uh, innovation fit together. Um, I'm going to talk about three ways that you can look at this combination. <clears throat> the first is uh, uh, innovation is a step in a strategy development process. Uh, this might be a grow the business strategy, for example. And innovation is one of the uh, one of the nodes that we want to think about as we're putting together a business growth strategy. Uh, another way to look at innovation is as part of the culture. It's sort of baked in to the way we do business around here. And finally, the third way that we'll talk about today is innovation as a, as a standalone strategy. So let's talk about innovation as process uh, first. <clears throat> um, you know, when we look at a workflow and we look for ways to uh, reduce waste or improve quality, uh, reduce the cycle time to gain efficiencies, uh, we see in the sales department, for example, that we have uh, two touch points after the inventory clerk passes on uh, an order, is the order ready, yes or no? <clears throat> well, if we were doing a continuous improvement uh, process project, we might look for innovation as a way of saying, let's reduce the number of steps in this workflow and uh, just have one touch point so that we can uh, reduce the time that it takes to go through this. So pro continuous improvement uh, uh, innovation. A good example of that is uh, Amazon where they have uh, consistently innovated both horizontally and vertically, and they continue to experiment and innovate uh, on a nearly uh, constant basis. <clears throat> and you can uh, uh, proof of that is the number of uh, new ideas that come out, number of new ways of doing things. For example, the one-click uh, purchase has actually been uh, licensed to other uh, companies. <clears throat> As uh, culture, innovation is culture. Uh, to quote Steve Jobs, creativity is just connecting things. Uh, so the goal here is to empower employees to create new things, make them better, and improve uh, processes. A lot of folks do this with uh, the way they organize the, uh, the workplace, right? Work hard, have fun, make a difference in your organization. Uh, so innovation is encouraged. It's baked in. It's built into the uh, business from uh, from culture uh, throughout everything that they do and think about. Um, an example uh, recently in uh, one of the um, one of the uh, news newspapers was uh, a quote that IBM is pulling some home office workers uh, back to regional offices to reinvigorate uh, innovation. <clears throat> they found that uh, by having so many folks work outside of offices, that they lost the uh, the idea spark that comes from uh, what I call grazing at the water cooler. You know, folks just having uh, informal conversations and dialogue and uh, creating uh, new ideas as part of the culture of the organization. So innovation is about change, and change is about changing hearts and minds. Uh, some things that we look for when we talk about uh, building a culture of innovation and change. One is a is a strong leadership uh, commitment. That's a critical factor. Employees have to understand that uh, innovation and change are part of the way we do business around here. Uh, we also need leaders who are what we call walk the talk. It's not just what I say, it's, it's, uh, it's what you see me do that, that matters. 
Um, employees have to be informed. They have to, we have to have good communications so that they understand the why and the how of the business case. Why are we doing what we're doing? And uh, allowing employees to find the, the, what we call the WIFM, the what's in it for me. Um, you have to have training and you have to have an infrastructure that supports uh, in innovation and change. And you also have to allow for what we call idea failure, right, to find things that work better. It's not just uh, a matter of coming up with uh, new ideas, it's a matter of testing those ideas and tracking the successes and, uh, and uh, living with the, uh, with the things that don't work, with the failures. So we see change enabled when employees are involved and equipped to deal with the change, <clears throat> and they see a visible commitment to, uh, to innovation and change. Uh, another um, quote, uh, this time from uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Amazon, says, if we want to be inventive, you have to experiment a lot, which means you have to fail a lot. You want to embrace what he calls high judgment failure. Uh, it's worth trying. It didn't work. So let's try something different. Uh, all of our most important successes at Amazon have been through that kind of failure. Fail, try again, and repeat that loop. Uh, so we get smarter as we uh, make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Um, one of the things that uh, we've learned is that uh, strategy-focused organizations start with the end in mind. For those of you who have uh, read any of uh, Stephen Covey's uh, work, that's one of the seven principles of uh, highly successful people, right? Start with the end in mind. Um, this is not a, uh, a Photoshop or an altered picture. This is a real picture of a highway of uh, uh, one of our clients somewhere in the world. And um, when the person who was uh, running the uh, line machine was uh, asked uh, why he didn't move the tree, he said it's not in his job description. He draws lines, he doesn't remove trees. Um, that's what happens when strategy is not everybody's job. We tend to look at our, our jobs in um, sort of narrow isolation rather than the, uh, the big picture. So let's look a little bit at uh, innovation as a strategy. <clears throat> I'm going to share some tools with you that we use uh, uh, a lot. Um, we've done this around 200 uh, for around 200 organizations in 40 countries now, and we uh, almost all of the engagements uh, we use a strategy profile or strategy canvas as a way of helping an organization understand what their discriminators are relative to the competition, if it's private sector, business, and industry. Uh, the, the same profile, by the way, will work with government and nonprofit. You can compare yourself, for example, against the best practices or against the uh, targets where you'd like to um, be uh, or where you found a best practice uh, somewhere else in the industry, a benchmark, for example. But the idea is to look at uh, the differentiators that uh, differentiate you from uh, from the competition. Uh, we use something called a customer value proposition, which is a, has three components, uh, what we call the functional attributes of the product or service that uh, we're in business to provide, uh, our image, you know, and the relationship uh, that we want with, uh, uh, with the outside world, with our employees. What, what do we want to be known as? Um, one of the discriminators uh, can be innovation. And you can then compare on a subjective scale. You know, this is not uh, highly analytical, but it certainly helps focus uh, attention on what I call the stuff that matters. Namely, what do we need to work on in our strategy to get better at our craft? So we use the strategy profile as a, as a tool to, uh, to help us do that. And of course, you want to work on the gaps, right? So we would um, want to make sure that when we develop our strategy and look at our scenarios, that we actually have addressed the gaps in what we where we recognize our shortcomings, for example. Um, another way to look at innovation uh, from a strategy point of view is as a strategic theme. I'll uh, use a little balanced scorecard uh, framework here. Uh, we talk about the uh, pillars of excellence or the uh, strategic themes, strategic focus areas is another uh, term for it. Um, <clears throat> we think of um, building a strategic planning and management system a lot like building a custom house. And the strategic uh, themes, uh, 
the pillars are the equivalent of load-bearing walls if you're uh, building a house. And um, innovation can be one of those pillars. The uh, floors of the house would be the perspectives. The foundation would have the uh, foundational components of a organization, engaged leadership, uh, two-way communications, and strong core values. And then the roof of the house would have things like the customer value proposition, the mission and the vision, and so on. <clears throat> Each strategic theme has a strategic result. Uh, that would be the equivalent of the lentil of a house holding up the roof. And uh, so the analogy is that if we make innovation a strategic theme, it goes throughout the whole structure of the organization. It touches uh, customer and stakeholder views of what we do, the financial performance, or if you're a government or nonprofit, the stewardship component of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the organization, internal business processes, and, that, <clears throat> and then the last uh, perspective, organizational capacity, what uh, Kaplan and Norton called uh, learning and growth. So that's another way of looking at it. Um, what, one of the things that uh, we do to help organize our minds around this is talk about strategy as altitude. And uh, when we're up at mission, vision, and uh, uh, the customer value proposition, we like to say we're up at about uh, 10,000 meters. You know, we're at high altitude. And as we um, and when we work on projects and operations, we keep the trains running on time. Uh, we're down at sea level, you know, we're at, uh, we're at uh, zero, uh, zero meters. So the idea of strategy is that it fits uh, in between high altitude and low altitude. It's, it's around, uh, you know, it's around uh, 8,000 uh, 8, meters, 25,000 feet. Um, and then when we go to break strategy into its uh, building blocks, into its next uh, lower components, we talk about strategic objectives as uh, you know, down around uh, uh, 20,000 feet or so. So this idea that there's a connection between the high altitude and the low altitude uh, is, um, is called connecting the dots. We want to be able to step down from high altitude to uh, the projects and programs that we're working on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, some other themes that you might use that get at innovation uh, that we've seen, innovation excellence, Growing the business, uh, technology leadership uh, depends what, uh, of course, the focus of the uh, organization is. Uh, who are its customers, its stakeholders, and uh, what value is it uh, trying to produce uh, for those customers and stakeholders? So another way to look at innovation then is actually as one of the strategic objectives, the building blocks, if you will, that make up uh, one of the strategies. So for example, we might have a strategic objective, the ovals on this graphic, as a uh, one of the um, objectives in the internal business process perspective. Uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with strategy mapping, you know that the strategy map is a, um, a collection of strategic objectives that are linked together in uh, cause-effect relationships. And uh, the map taken as a whole shows a snapshot of how the organization creates value. Uh, if you're in uh, government uh, for your citizens, if you're in a private business, you create value. Uh, financial uh, would be the uh, end of the value chain, and uh, that would be for the owners of the business. So the fact that customer is in the top perspective in this chart indicates that this is an example for a government or a not-for-profit where the end of the value chain is a satisfied member if you're in an association or a satisfied uh, customer, citizen, stakeholder if, uh, if you're in the, uh, in the government. And financial takes on a, a stewardship tone because uh, we're using um, uh, taxpayer money or, or, or funds from other uh, sources to uh, provide our, uh, our services. So anyway, we can think of uh, innovation then as one of the building blocks of a strategy. So again, a little lower altitude than the strategic theme itself. Some other possible um, objectives that we have uh, seen, uh, increasing technology utilization, improving uh, culture, innovation culture, increasing innovative solutions, improving process efficiency, and increased service accessibility. Uh, let me just uh, take a minute here and talk uh, just for a second about strategic objectives. You'll notice 
when you look at these that they all start with an action verb. Um, a lot of strategy maps uh, aren't built uh, like that. They're, they have activities or projects in them. And um, it's really important that you build continuous improvement into your strategy. And this is one way of uh, doing it. Uh, we found uh, after, uh, after doing this for, uh, for some years. So uh, we always look for that action verb that creates continuous improvement potential in the strategy. And um, so you might want to check your strategy map uh, against that. It, uh, it's really a best practice to have continuous improvement built into that. So let's look at an example of a strategy map. In this case, uh, we're looking at a multimedia company, international multimedia company. Uh, the strategic result that they're looking for is to be a leading innovator in multimedia products and uh, productions. <clears throat> so in the organization capacity framework, we have uh, strategic objectives that are um, shown here. We want to maximize technology, technological capacity, increase the artistic expertise, improve cross-functional teamwork among the designers and the artists, continue a culture, or improve a culture of innovation, and improve project management. Uh, I put a dark, um, uh, a dark red circle around the ones where uh, innovation is, um, you know, is, 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 is likely to make a difference. So for example, when you build your strategy map and then you go to the process components of the, uh, of the strategy map and you have those strategic objectives, you can go all the way up to the top. In this case, it's a business, so financial is in the top position on the perspectives. The end of the value chain is to increase uh, profits for the business. But when you look at all the opportunities for innovation, you know, rather than thinking of it sort of narrowly, you think of it as potential for making a difference in each of these strategic objectives, you get an idea of how powerful uh, a lever innovation can be. You know, it's not just about technology, right? It's about you know, changing the way we do a workflow, the, uh, the process steps that we use, looking for places to eliminate uh, waste and improve quality, improve timeliness. So looking at it like this, I think, adds another dimension to uh, innovation. And uh, it also allows you to, to put a fence around uh, the components of a strategy. I, I can't tell you how powerful the strategy map is. It, you know, it takes, it takes time to build it right. But when you get it done, uh, it really tells a story of how the organization creates value for its customers or its uh, stakeholders. Um, I think, uh, frankly, in the last 25 years, probably the best contribution I've seen to the, the science of management is, uh, is the strategy map and the refinements over the years in, in uh, what makes a good strategy map, a best practice strategy map. So anyway, by putting a fence around the strategic objective and then focusing on how you can improve within that uh, objective, you start realizing that by connecting the objectives, you can connect the changes that innovation can make. And you can, can get a multiplier effect in innovation uh, through a business. So very powerful tool. I uh, advise you to, uh, uh, to, to use that in, uh, in your own work with, uh, with your organizations. Joe? All right, Howard, I'll switch over to uh, my machine here. All right. <clears throat> Let's make sure I got that. All right. All right, as we uh, move through the, uh, the listing on the introduction slide of topical areas that we we're going to hit at, the next one in line was measuring strategy and innovation. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the things in this process uh, of doing innovation or process changes that will hopefully lead to um, some changes uh, in the way the business is operated, uh, both uh, fundamentally from a increased profitability if you're a for-profit organization or better services uh, to constituents if you're a government or nonprofit. We have to make sure that what we put a lot of man hours and budget into uh, really did result in something uh, that was beneficial to everyone. Uh, Winston Churchill couldn't have said it better. I mean, it comes down to in the very end state, 
you have to measure what matters. And one of the things that we help clients get to when they start doing their strategy building, and of course, one of the hot buttons that we hear in a lot of conversations from clients today is uh, we need to innovate. We need to change the way our innovation works here. Uh, we just need to get more creative. And, uh, and, and that's clearly a call to, to action that they know that something has to change. And right now, the, the biggest catalyst for most of that is technology because it's very cheap, it's very available. And a lot of organizations can do things today that they couldn't do even two or three years ago. And uh, so once you get the strategy built, you have to look at the results. And so we need to measure what matters as we go through this process of uh, innovation and strategy built around innovation. There's a number of touch points on KPIs, uh, performance measures, uh, that are uh, used through the process of building a strategy, especially around the balanced scorecard. Uh, starting on the left, uh, you have a whole series of strategic measures that are associated much like those objectives you saw from Howard's earlier slide in the financial perspective, the customer uh, satisfaction, customer stakeholder, internal processes, and the organizational capacity. Uh, one of the interesting things about the organizational capacity in a full all-out innovation initiative is and, and most clients that have not really done or completed or tried innovation type uh, initiatives or objectives in the past, this will be their first bump up against the culture change. And Howard talked about that already. Uh, there's a whole different aspect of culture that has to be rolled out and trained and ingrained uh, in this process. And I'll touch a little bit more about that later. But this is a major cultural change for organizations that have not done any uh, in, uh, innovation uh, projects or initiatives. Uh, in the center column, uh, you've got your operational measures, uh, which pretty much are standard operating procedure for all strategies. You know, are you increasing your efficiency? Or is your output changing? Is your quality changing? Is your timeliness changing? I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, when you take a look at a couple of KPIs on innovation that seem to come to the surface, when you've done enough research is it really does come down to the percent of innovations that significantly advance the business. Now, if you're for profit, obviously you want to see the results up in your financial perspective. You would increase profitability, increase your revenues, and along the way, you've probably reduced your costs. If you're government and nonprofit, it's all about making sure that the efficiency and the timeliness and the productivity is there using the resources that you have available. Project measures, they do not go away in this process. In fact, when you move into the innovation arena uh, with objectives or projects, the project measures become even more critical because one of the things that's an element that I'll talk about in just a few minutes is you're going to have to put funds together for innovation projects and innovation initiatives. Uh, they don't just happen as a part of the normal budget. Uh, so once you've decided and made a decision that you will pursue something that's innovation driven, uh, your budget requirements are going to be a little bit different than probably you saw in the past. Employee measures, no doubt about it. Uh, I saw someone asked about uh, in the question box about SMART. And <laughs> these employee measures don't, they're the same in a regular strategy plan and a balanced scorecard strategy plan. And in this case, in the SMART objectives for employees, they are uh, the same aspect, except they're focused on innovation-driven uh, initiatives and projects. Risk measures, absolutely. These probably even come to the surface faster in an innovation-driven environment uh, because you just have a number of activities and, and touch points and targets that you don't really know uh, what the outcome will be. Now, if you're just looking at, in a little bit, we'll have this concept of a core business. If you're looking at your core business, I mean, you know your business. And now the, the thing is you want to defend your position in your core business. So the risks are probably identifiable. But you move to the next horizon, uh, and that is you want to expand out into something that you're currently not in now. Now those risk factors ramp up pretty uh, 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 dramatically. And of course, everything's driven by some kind of performance analysis and management and internal and public reporting going forward. 
depending on if you're for-profit government or nonprofit. So let's take a look at uh, one that is just about on everyone's strategy plan uh, is the objective of improved customer satisfaction. And this is a good example, as Howard said earlier, of starting with the end in mind. Uh, customer experience drives the positive behaviors. Uh, you know, what do we want for a for-profit business? We want repeat orders. What do we want for uh, customer satisfaction is we want recommendations. Uh, I think anyone in the for-profit world has heard the term net promoter score. You want that score as high as possible because in the end of the day, those recommendations from their colleagues, friends, family uh, make a difference. A uh, simple one that, that I use and we, we used until they quit making that particular line of car was the Saturn line of cars in, in General Motors. Uh, my wife was the first one to buy a Saturn, and that car is still running and requires very little maintenance. So when it came time for me to buy a car, it was it was a no-brainer. I just went back to the dealer and said, give me the next model of Saturn that you've got in this configuration, and the same results. So that net promoter score becomes very important. If we go down through the process, uh, it really does come down to percent satisfied, reorders, new customer recommendations. Now, by the way, if you're a government or nonprofit, you want your constituents satisfied. You may have a monopoly or the only game in town because you're a government agency, but it still is re important to make sure that that satisfaction level is high because the last thing you need is a lot of publicity on a lot of websites to say the service at XYZ agency is not up to par. Here's in what happened. People just don't like to hear negatives especially in a government or a nonprofit organization setting. Along that continuum, uh, you're going to have very varying elements in resourcing products, services, if you're government, nonprofit, customer facing, and the delivery, or in most government and nonprofit organizations, is accessibility of your services uh, to your constituents or geography. If we look at resourcing, it's all about the budget, workforce, full-time equivalents, infrastructure. And product attributes, it goes back to that previous slide, quality, efficiency, effectiveness, and keeping the cost low. And customer interaction, accurate information, problem solved quickly, and your service delivery, is it on time, is it, and is the order correct? And you saw that in uh, one of Howard's earlier charts on uh, process uh, decomposition. Well. The, the KPIs that come out of those particular process flows are very straightforward. You know, what are your costs? What's your input output for efficiency? What's your time to process? Accurate orders? Did you deliver it on time? And did you deliver it cor cor correctly? All those go into making up that improved customer satisfaction final KPI. And let's face it. If you're in an innovation mode and you, your organization has said we need to innovate, one of the first things you're going to do is look at who the receiver of your services and products are, and that's your customer. And in a little bit we'll talk about one of the major steps in innovation is you go out and ask your customers and your constituents as to what do we have to do differently, and that may drive some innovation changes that you or process changes that you have to do back in your organization. Let's take a look at uh, a potential uh, organization by perspective uh, and themes. So we have, you know, any we have any in terms of a balanced scorecard, we have strategic themes, and we have the perspectives, organizational capacity, internal processes, customer stakeholder, financial stewardship. Now remember, organizational capacity uh, is the right people with the right skills at the right time, with the right tools and the right infrastructure and the right governance. There's a lot of aspects to the organizational capacity. But for our example here, we're going to start with something that's uh, innovation related, and we'll start with employees cross-train. That will, should have an effect on putting all of those activities in the organizational capacity level in play in the internal process level. So if we can cross-train them, we have the ability now to move people around. By the way, this whole concept of cross-trained employees or agile work environments or workforces is a very major initiative on a lot of our clients today. Why? They need to keep costs low, so they need to keep the headcount low. They need to have the people trained so they can plug people in where they need them plugged in. 
So they're kind of like very dynamic teams that get formed uh, to, to work on specific areas of the organization. And if the missed deadlines are reduced, new accounts can be more easily added, and hopefully at the end of the day, you've got more cash on hand. But let's take a look at another one, which is more innovation driven. What about if you do start an, initi an innovation initiative, the first process you're gonna do is you're probably gonna go out and ask your own employees uh, what, what ought to change. And the first thing you'll do is you'll get a whole laundry list of ideas, and obviously you have to have some processes in place to sort through those ideas to see which ones uh, have the biggest potential bang for the investment uh, out the back end. Uh, this is a, a, some organizations, this is a new thing. They, quite frankly, when I ask clients, how often have you asked your employees about contributing new ideas? And there's silence in the room. And it's like, why would you not ask your employees? They're the ones that are working every day with your clients and your stakeholders, and they, they have frontline experiences that can be brought back to the organization and be worked into the internal processes in this case, which is to reduce the process cycle time. Obviously, shorter cycle times, more customers are satisfied, and in the case of a for-profit, it's sales growth per year. So the key message here is understand how organization capacity and business processes and innovation drive customer and financial results. And this is a good slide to set the stage for the next topic uh, on innovation management, which fundamentally talks about the concept of innovation in all types of organizations. When, when a lot of government ministries, government agencies, nonprofit organizations sees this chart, their first, their first internal comment is, well, we're not a profit-making organization. We cannot use anything innovation to move us forward. That is a myth. You all have a play in this concept of innovation-driven change and strategy. So when you measure strategy, execution, and innovation, as we saw now a couple times, you start with the end in mind. What are you trying to accomplish? You have to identify the desired outcomes and write the intended results statements. You have to get very specific about this. Uh, a lot of organizations just try to go to a book, pick a bunch of KPIs, and we really don't know if they uh, are attached to the organization strategy or not. You have to put every performance measure under a stethoscope or, mi or microscope before and after the critical process steps. It's never a first done deal out of the shoot or out of the starting line on performance measures or KPIs. You have to review those. That's why in our process from the Institute that's step nine evaluation, if you follow it religiously, then you will do that on at least a quarterly basis to look at your performance measure results. You have to think about where you can apply innovation to the selected processes and measure before and after effects. There's no question about it. I mean, that key performance indicator I mentioned earlier about the percent innovations that significantly advance the existing business, in that case, you're gonna have a series of KPIs that will talk about what the business was before, and you're gonna have a series of KPIs that are gonna talk about what the business is now that you put the innovation in place. You measure the contribution of the new products and services at the, at the margin. Same KPI. What contributions did they make? Where did you see the biggest change? If you've got a multi-product, uh, multi-faceted product line, you may even find that if the innovation was applied to one product area, you may see the demand fall off for other products. Well, that's just a realization that whatever you did new with the latest innovation changes made product A better than product B. And the, and the marketplace is clearly saying, we like A. And as Howard said, you need to bake in the innovation conversations at management review meetings. Those management review meetings, depending on level of the organization, and it should be at all levels, you're gonna talk about innovation there as much like you're gonna talk about strategy as you go through each of the uh, daily routine. So let's talk about innovation management. Now, when you, and from experience, this is both, um, my experience inside the IBM Corporation, uh, I was involved in uh, software development, uh, software design, and uh, rollout. And so I sat through a lot of meetings uh, that are very similar to this slide. And, and it's interesting, when you look at enough of the innovation process um, techniques, 
all of these particular terms like market opportunity analysis, product development, technology evaluation selection, high-tech entrepreneurship, and then launch and commercialization. They all seem to take on the same guys, just on different labels. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you start an innovation management process, it really does start with the competitor, customers and competitors. You need to start by asking your current marketplace exactly what you want. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're working in a vacuum. Uh, and if you want to really innovate, you have to go out and get their frontline field experience from the customers and competitors. You have to look at yourself inwardly and say, what do we currently have from our own technology capabilities? Uh, what do we have that we can use at a current? What do we need to do to refine? What do we need to go out and buy? What do we need to go out and partner with? And that aspect of the entire innovation process is just growing exponentially in terms of using any one of those levers uh, to go out and, and uh, positioning yourself to a different horizon of innovation. You have to look in at your own product development capability. And then you should probably start identifying and taking on the identification of an entrepreneurial environment for any in innovation management approach. And, and in the case of some organizations we work with, just introducing the word ent internal entrepreneurial activity is something new. They didn't look at themselves like that. We are just departments A, B, and C lined up to do X, Y, and Z, and, and we've done that for the last 30 years and we'll continue to do it the same way. Well. Right across the street, your competitor might be doing something different, similar in the marketplace to your products and services, but they're doing something a little bit different. Well, they got a little bit more entrepreneurial about what needed to be done to satisfy the market. And then eventually, uh, you're going to launch and commercialize uh, any of your innovation or your process improvements uh, going forward. Otherwise, you just did a lot of, infra lot of budget expansion, a lot of resource expansion, and you haven't really seen what you were looking for. And the circular spin in and spin out there, I should explain, sometimes during this process, you're going to find out that, yes, uh, what we want to do in terms of the next, that target, the end in mind uh, of where we want to be with the innovation at the back end, we can do it internally. So we can spin that inside the organization. Many times you're, you go, have to go out and create a new venture, and that's where these partnership alliances licensing technology from other sources comes in as a new uh, a new venture uh, creation. Now, I want to take you through something that's been in the in the um, technology world and it really applies to the technology government and nonprofit and services world for some time. Now there's two continuums when you take a look at the horizons of strategic innovation. If you're a business and industry or for profit, you have two two axes. The y-axis is definitely about profit performance. Horizons, uh, the, inno the innovation world in for-profit organization has one end in mind, and that is to grow the business. And so what are you going to do differently tomorrow than you were doing today? And the time frame can be anywhere from months to years, but in most innovation processes or product development, it's time is year. The first horizon in the 1999 uh, discussion about the alchemy of growth was labeled the extend and defend your core businesses. It's what you do today. It's your mission statement, what you're doing today. You want to extend them and defend them. What do you have to do differently? Over the time between 99 and now, if you look at a lot of literature, you start to see this term called core, which is innovation in existing operations and markets. So. These labels have morphed a little bit, but they basically mean the same thing. Core is what you're currently doing in operations and markets today. If you want to move to Horizon 2, you're sitting in a business, and uh, we're taking the business and industry for-profit view right now. Uh, you want to build your emerging businesses. You have some that started as a derivative or an offshoot of what your core or your core businesses were, and now you want to build on those. Uh, in the latest uh, list of uh, literature, you're going to see this word keeps cropping up called adjacent. It's uh, innovation in new but related areas of the business and markets. And finally, and this is out on the fringe, is the horizon three. It's create viable options for new businesses. You know, what is, could possibly happen? 
you know, would anyone have thought that unless you were a hardcore watcher of Star Trek back in the early days, that we'd all have handheld communicators? That was a Horizon 3 at that particular point in time. New, new businesses, mobile communications. And in this case, it was very transformative. And that's the latest word that you see in a lot of the in, in literature today. Innovation to create new businesses and markets. And you've seen what happened when the technology curve has matured in some of those cell phone and mobile markets. We've seen companies come and go. So they've gone through their own horizon one, two, and three aspect as we go through. Now, one of the things in business, or you have to, to kickstart your process, you have to give yourself some kickstart questions. And we purposely listed these from the lowest level to the highest level because these questions starting at one are basically focused around horizon one. And there's a couple of more questions that are in horizon two and three. But it's, it, it really starts with how do, could we increase sales and services to the same customers or constituents with the same product or services mix. And again, we'll go straight up, And but what these set of questions really do is gives you degrees of freedom to do whatever you wanna do in this innovation space. You may not want to do much outside of Horizon One. You just wanna make sure you defend your space in Horizon One. But you know to really be here tomorrow you need to start looking at Horizon 2. So how could we expand the sales by developing better delivery systems for the customers? Now, if you really want to get really uh, into the high risk side, depending on what your business is, how can we grow the change the industry through acquisitions and alliances, which is pretty standard fare for a lot of businesses today. So these are a set of questions for the for-profit world. Now, the government and nonprofit, they have a play in the horizons of innovation as well. Your y-axis gets changed from profit to program and service reach and effectiveness. That's what government agencies and nonprofits are all about. Are you improving the quality of life and capabilities of your constituents and your nonprofit target audiences? Same time frame, could be months or years. Your horizons are very much core, improve the cost effectiveness, and transformative. What can you see that is doing something different? So consequently, you'll see that you have a play in the three horizons as well, and it's not just something that's for the for-profit world. That core is innovation of delivery of existing operations and program services. You're just getting better at what you do and being more cost-effective. Why? If you're more cost-effective, you've got more budget allocation capabilities to use those budgets for other uh, initiatives. You can improve the cost effectiveness as you go through. Every government organization that gets a budget allocation is being told by its budgeting aspects that come through from the government, we want you to get more cost effective. And then eventually, you as the service deliverer for the government, for the ministry, you have to sit down and bring back to the government budget process how you're going to change things that might have to change in the future. Um, I'll, I'll give you one uh, that um, is a very base Horizon 1, which I just saw recently. Uh, I'm at that age where I signed up for Medicare. Uh, Medicare had only one, two ways for me to pay my monthly statement. I could write a check or I could let them automatically deduct something from my checking account. Well, I personally don't like that. Now, all of a sudden, I see a notification come through that says, good news, we've changed the delivery capabilities of your payments. You can time, you can automatic withdraw, you can write a check, or you can give us your routing and account information from your checking account on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and we'll do it that way. Hallelujah. I mean, that's exactly what I was asking them uh, for many years after I had to go on Medicare here in the United States. Same set of questions. You need some kickstarts. Do we have a clear understanding of the stakeholders' needs and the available programs and services that satisfy those needs? If we don't, then you you're really need to step back and think about how you're going to start on this innovation-driven changes to your business. Could we extend the reach by offering services to new stakeholders? Another one, look it up on five, getting up to Horizon 2 and 3. How can we expand into new service areas or localities 
not currently served. One of the uh, nonprofit organizations that uh, I worked with here in the United States happened to be in San Bernardino County. San Bernardino County is the largest geographic square mile county in the, in the United States. It has everything from deserts to mountain ranges to municipal cities. And one of their biggest elements that they were dealing with was how do we get the services out to those uh, constituents and stakeholders in those desert areas. And so they were playing in the horizon two and three uh, without even knowing it at that point. And they were getting into the innovation thought about how we get our services out there. So you need to talk to your customers. Well, IdeaStorm is how Dell does it. Dell started this in 2007. They simply went out and said, tell us what you think our product should be or could be. And as of the screenshot of the IdeaStorm site for, for Dell, you can see at that point they had 745,868 plus ideas submitted. And they turned out of those six-figure numbers, 550 plus. Now, do these guys in that little top recent contributors, do they get paid for this? No. They are such dyed-in-the-wool Dell clients and customers, they'll give them the ideas for free. And you can see that this is not an inactive site. March 29th, March 21st, uh, these are all, I mean, this is a pretty good clip for February and March for them. It allows them to bring the ideas in to move the Dell innovation needle forward. And it's very active uh, when you go out and look at that site. Here's one that's probably up close and personal to all of you, regardless of where you are in the world. Starbucks does the same thing. You can sign up. You can submit ideas on products, you can submit ideas on experience, and you can submit involvement areas because they are very much corporate social responsibility driven. Well, my message here is when you look at the number of ideas for those products, do you think the staff, the corporate staff at Starbucks would ever think about 47,969 ideas for coffee and espresso drinks? I think not. The easiest way to get the ideas is to talk to your customers or constituents. And there's a lot of technology out there in the world that makes this very easy for you to do now. And that's why I said earlier we're benefiting by a change in technology. When you look at enough literature on, on innovation-driven initiatives and change for organizations and strategy, there's five elements that start to focus, come to the surface on a repetitive basis. Howard already mentioned one of them, leadership. Leadership makes innovation a priority. And if you haven't been an innovation-driven organization at the present time when you want to start doing innovation, this is a big step. The leadership has to get their mindset set. And it has to make sure it happens in a systematically driven era. In other words, you don't just go out and solicit a bunch of ideas and then the rest of the organization doesn't hear about them anymore. The leadership has to make sure that that word gets out. You have to focus on the people. Uh, key thing is here, make sure you empower the employees, partners, customers, and others to contribute. You have to identify those ideas and you keep the ones that are best. So that means you have a process in the background that you vet every one of these ideas. That means you've got teams that look at those ideas that come through. The key thing here on an, in an innovation initiative is that you have executive management or managers, middle managers assigned and they are accountable. So you might say that that becomes a performance KPI for those managers saying, how many ideas did you get in? How many did you vet? How many did you fund? And what was the end result? The process, very structured and dynamic. You get the ideas from inside and outside. You're gonna wind up developing new capabilities. You gotta support the business cases. You got to make sure that the innovations are subsequently delivered. That was the whole process, whole point in de developing in, uh, innovation-driven initiatives or projects. And you have to make sure that the benefits were realized. Right back to that KPI about innovations that significantly advance the existing business. This is one that's going to create new levels and new types of funding. 
So if you're in core one or horizon one, you're working on your core businesses. You probably got budgets already earmarked to do process improvements. But now you're going to take a little look at an idea about moving something that's innovative in. How are we going to change over to the latest technology driven that's going to make an innovation change to our processes? But if you're going to start playing in horizon two and three, you're going to have some funding buckets that are put in place that are going to deal with the risks of expansion and the risk of uh, moving into not seen at this organization ever, but we know that's where we need to go. And eventually, again, we're back to that benefits realized. Uh, you know, you have to have those in place because why you'll miss major opportunities and for innovation that could be missed. Now, let's talk about the big kahuna, so to speak, the big elephant in the room, which is culture, especially in organizations that haven't had any innovation-driven uh, initiatives or projects or strategy. Well, you have to develop that culture across the organization. You have to make sure that you're, everyone is looking for ways to improve the business today and tomorrow, and it becomes ingrained in the organization's thought processes. And you have to make sure that these teams are rewarded and recognized when they get it right. Are they going to get everything right? No. Howard already talked about it. You have to have a failure-tolerant organization on some of these innovation initiatives. Now, talking about the culture, I went back in my notes. I had the, the very great capability of being a civilian attache for the retired Admiral Hyman Rickover, who was, as anyone knows, their submarine history knows that he was the father of the nuclear navy. So just think about it from an innovation standpoint. We're going to replace all the diesel engines in the, in the submarines and put nuclear reactors uh, inside the subs. On one of my uh, close uh, breakfast meetings with him, I asked him that question. He, I said, what was, your, what, was your, what was your key to making sure that you got this innovation changed for the basic submarine? And he came back to me and he said, first thing is you have to make sure that those teams, and this would be those managers I talked about earlier, they're focused. They stay focused on what they are looking at and what they're trying to do. You have to realize that when you get your team together, you got a whole bunch of great people, great knowledge, great experiences, but many of them may be dancing to a different set of music. So the first thing is you have to get them in the same music script. You have to get them together. And you have to make sure that you keep them isolated and focused on what they're working on and don't let them get distracted. You have to create an atmosphere of creative stress. I thought that was a great quote because I've heard that from other technology customers, clients that the Institute has worked with. You, you have to create an, a creative stress, an atmosphere of create creativity, which keeps it very tight and very high RPM. Uh, revolutions per minute of everything that they're working through. You have to keep reminding them and keep you know keep everyone competing to solve one problem. We don't want to go in looking at one end result and, f and people get off the rails and looking at different things. And as Admiral Rickover would say, if anyone knows his history, and this goes back to those innovation managers, there's only one ringmaster. And in the case of these teams, it's that innovation manager. He's like the ultimate project manager on this, or she's the ultimate project manager on this. One ringmaster keeps everything moving in the right direction. Howard? Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> um, we'll um, close off the, uh, the presentation. And um, let me uh, flip back to, uh, to my screen here. <clears throat> catch up with uh, where Joe was. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the, um, I, I, one of the common misconceptions is that, um, uh, you know, we're doing, we're innovating <clears throat> and we're communicating. And uh, I've always liked uh, this quote, a common misconception uh, with these is the illusion that they've actually 
taken place. Uh, I hope uh, today that you've got uh, learned some different ways of looking at uh, at innovation and um, realize that uh, you can look at it through different lenses and that it is um, reflective of a whole organization. It's uh, you, you can't just think of innovation as something with a fence around it. <clears throat> it affects uh, processes and people and and uh, involves technology and strategy and so on. So it's complicated. It's uh, multi-dimensional. And I think if you approach it from uh, from that point of view, you'll uh, you'll be better served than just put one person in charge of innovation, you know, the chief of innovation. Uh, the idea is to make us all innovative and think uh, in uh, in new ways to move an organization forward. It's a journey, not a project. Uh, I think that's the way to close this uh, close this uh, off. <clears throat> um, Ryan, you want to pick up here? This is the um, um, availability of a discount if uh, you're going to join us for the um, strategy execution and innovation forum in uh, Dubai. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, contact this person. Um, we have posted a PDF of the slides, and um, they uh, you can get them here if uh, you want to. And I think the recording uh, of this uh, presentation is going to be put up by uh, Informa uh, within uh, uh, by tomorrow, I believe. So you'll have uh, access to two versions of the uh, presentation. So I think uh, maybe we should open it up uh, for questions. Uh, do we have any time left? Ryan, I'll let you be the ringmaster here to... Uh, yep, yeah, absolutely. I think we should proceed with some questions for then some that have been posted throughout. So um, I know that Joe has been looking at them and answering a few uh, throughout. So um, if you guys want to have a look and address some of the specific ones, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah, Howard, let's talk uh, with the first one. Uh, this would be a good one to kick off with. Uh, who would be in the management? Who in the management would be accountable for innovation management? Is there a certain role or department? Who also monitors and reports that? <clears throat> I think uh, when most folks hear innovation, they think of uh, of an IT solution that we have to um, apply technology to improve a process or a workflow or something. Uh, you know, I think today, hopefully, you've learned that there's other ways of thinking about uh, innovation. Um, you know, the chief strategy officer would have a role in this. If you have a strategy management office, uh, they could have a role uh, in innovation. I, I don't think there's one answer to who should lead uh, innovation. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you followed the thread through the presentation, uh, I'll repeat what I just said a little while ago, that innovation is about all of us, uh, not about one of us. And um, you know, I guess the way to uh, to think about it, you could each, you could actually argue that this could be an HR function as well, because we're trying to change the culture. And if we change the culture, you know, and we have uh, water cooler conversations, and we make it easy for folks to come up with new ideas, and we accept failure, that's all about uh, changing the organization to be more innovatively focused. So I think it takes a team to figure out where to put innovation in an organization, but recognize that even if you create something called a chief innovation officer, uh, his or her job you know, is not to do it alone. Uh, I'll give the same advice here that we do to folks who set up uh, strategic planning. Um, you know, we, we don't do it with one individual. There may be one individual who's the ringmaster, but the reality is that if we're going to become a strategy-focused organization, we're all going to have to be involved in that. So, for example, when we build these balanced scorecard systems, we involve a multiple uh, group of people. You know, we'll do it with the 10 or 20 or 30 folks to make sure that there is buy-in as the process is being uh, uh, run, as the scorecard system is being built. That way, when those folks go back to their individual uh, organizations, uh, they're part of the solution. You know, it's their strategic plan. It's not just the the head of strategic planning, his or her plan. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. So, uh, you know, one lesson learned here is make sure you uh, you involve a team, you involve a group, and you start building employee buy-in, whether you're doing strategic planning or you're doing uh, innovation planning. Uh, it's, a, it's a group effort. It's not an individual effort. Okay. Uh, we had a question about um, 
can you, uh, regards to uh, training, uh, should we start with the process or with the mindset culture? Well, uh, I'll take that one, Howard. Uh, yeah. Basically, it's a combination of things. Uh, once you've got that executive buy-in or that leadership buy-in that says, yes, we need to look at some new innovative way to change our processes. Uh, we need, uh, you know, our product line is, uh, this is another term that I hear occasionally from for-profit organizations is our product line is stale. In fact, I just recently saw that and in, in, in the fashion industry, that's a very big one. You got to keep the the fashion industry has a constant change in what's appealing. Uh, and some product areas, organizations know that they've pushed their product profitability with their current product line as far as they can go. They need to make a change. So the key thing is um, it's a combination of things that you have to put in place. You've got to have the right culture in place. You know you're going to take a look at the processes. You know that the leadership has to be committed to what they need to have done. You need to be able to commit funds. And you need to make sure that you're really anchored in what your customers or stakeholders need, regardless if you're for-profit or uh, non-profit or government. Yeah, I would add that uh, uh, it's it's a lot easier to start a training program than it is a change the change the hearts and minds program uh, in terms of how long it takes to see results. But um, re remember, when you do training, that the, it's not training that's the outcome, right? The outcome is uh, improved skills or improved knowledge or improved abilities. And a lot of folks put the emphasis on the wrong thing. They think that they're going to count training and that that's the accomplishment. Uh, again, if you go back to the advice from uh, Stephen Covey and start with the end in mind, what I want are smarter people. And how am I going to get that? Well, I can go outside the organization. I can train within. There's different strategies you could use to get smarter, uh, smarter people, better processes. So put the emphasis on what we're trying to accomplish. It's a key takeaway from this. Uh, let's take this one. In terms of strategic management and focusing on execution, what is the best way to co coordinate the balanced scorecard approach with organizational uh, dynamics, or OD, or organizational development, and action research modeling? Hmm. Um, Wow, let's see. Let's think about that for a minute. Um, you know, the, the balance scorecard is a big tent, and it involves uh, a lot of different elements of an organization that's trying to get to higher performance. Um, I like to say that you can put your project management in the balance scorecard. Uh, you can put uh, performance measurement within the balance scorecard. If you think of the balance scorecard as an integrated strategic planning and management framework and system, um, you know, that's different today than it was 20 years ago when we thought of the balance scorecard as a way of organizing performance measures into four categories, right? So today it's much more dynamic. It includes change management. It includes continuous improvement. Uh, it includes strategy execution. It includes innovation. It includes uh, strategic initiative management. So I, I think if you think of the balance scorecard in a broad sense and say, where do some of these other things fit? Where can they make a contribution? You know, it's the same as bringing in these different uh, tools, you know, SWOT on the front end or PESTLE, you know, internal and external analysis, performance measures, uh, aligning the organization through cascading. All of these things have a, have a home in a balanced scorecard system. The key is to get the sequence right. You know, you got two, two things you have to worry about. One is the altitude that you're at, and the second is the step that you're at to make sure that what you're working on connects with, with what already has been built. We like to call that connecting the dots as you go down in altitude. So, you know, I would ask you to ask yourself the question, um, where, where can I put another tool, another model, another uh, capability uh, into the balance scorecard framework so that it makes a contribution and we get better results out of the system. Um, I'd have to really think through the, the nuances of that to answer it more specifically, but you know, start with the big picture, I guess I'd say, and see where you can um, you know, put, put things in. For example, project management, the PMP certification, that fits really nicely into the internal business process with the process improvement projects. So you can bring in 
the elements of project management measurement, right? Risk and schedule adherence and, and scope creep and resource adherence, they fit into a balanced scorecard framework when you think of the framework in, the, in a broad sense as a, as a, as a system. Uh, we have a number of questions about getting a copy of the presentation. You will get a link uh, emailed to your uh, registration email for this webinar with a link uh, where you can download the, uh, the, uh, the presentation that was given today. Uh, here's an interesting one that I think uh, uh, was asked. How do you see a combined role of chief customer experience officer and chief strategy officer for innovation and strategy execution? Well. I think basically from this presentation today, those two individuals or teams should be talking to each other on a consistent basis uh, because it's the customer experience or customer relations. Uh, in fact, working with one of my clients worldwide customer relations aspect, they indicated during their strategy build for their department that one of their constant streams of information and connections is to the uh, strategy officer for innovation and strategy, because that's where they needed to make sure that the products were being redesigned and the new feature functions were being added that the customer experience uh, feedback was giving them. Uh, I can, and, I, and by the way, this that was a tech company, but that doesn't matter. I've seen the same thing happening right up the road from me here at one of the county governments. Uh, a very big aspect of understanding and getting feedback from the constituents to come to their offices as to what they need and how this particular agency has to change. So those two have to be almost connected at the hip and have to maintain a very open and candid <clears throat> communication line uh, between each other. Yeah, let me reinforce that uh, with an example. Uh, my uh, wife worked for one of the um, large uh, uh, cell phone companies that has uh, since gone out of business. And I remember at a uh, party that uh, we went to. I was talking to uh, the head of research and development, and later talking to one of the one of the sales uh, senior sales folks. And uh, I, I asked them, you know, well, how do you guys t talk to each other? How do you get research and development into uh, into the new into new new phones designs? And the guy said, you know, we don't do a very good job of that. He said we don't have a formal structure for taking the results of what the R and D uh, folks are coming up with, the new ideas and and what I'm hearing from customers who want specific features in the next version of the mo mobile phone. Uh, and I, I never forget that conversation because it just struck me that, you know, these guys aren't on the right team. There is no team at the intersection, the Venn diagram of where these two interests intersect. And so maybe that's the way to look at it. You know, think about it like a Venn diagram where you find the, you know, find the overlaps and make sure that we have folks who, 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 who can talk sales and who can talk customer experience and who can talk research and development, right? It's a, it's a mix of skills that have to come together uh, in an innovation sense to, to move something forward. Hard light of the time. I think we'll take one more question, but we'll let the audience know that uh, we'll capture all of these questions and uh, gen up a response to each of them and then uh, mail them out in mass to the uh, registration database that was picked up for this all, right, and all of you can uh, all of you can do um, uh, you know benefit from um, what all the other your colleagues were saying on this call uh, let's see all right and I think we got one here Yeah, this is a this is a good one to end on. In your experience, what company has the best or better strategy on innovation? Uh, can this be measured? I have one in mind, Howard, but I'll let you talk to that one first. Um, well, we talked about uh, how it could be measured through different um, through different types of measures. I think uh, you know the the key is it's not just one measure. It's not a measure of of innovation. Uh, now, technically, you could build a composite index that might be called the innovation uh, index, right, or indicator, uh, and you could you could uh, use components from where you've applied innovation in different parts of the 
business, whether it's the product development or process improvement or um, you know uh, IT uh, uh, IT uh, fixes. Um, so you could come up with a with a master indicator like that, but I think that misses the point uh, because you want to have innovation in the various departments, you know, that where they're applying continuous improvement. So the question is, how does you measure continuous improvement? And we talked about that earlier. You can put a put your performance measurement stethoscope uh, in different parts of the process and decide to, to make some changes and see what the difference is on the outputs. Uh, and then you know the outcome. So that, that's the way I would look at it. Uh, I, I mean, I've got a company in in mind that uh, does this really well as well. So there are examples, but um, uh, I think the key is how you look at innovation is not just as one thing, but it's a collection of uh, of ways of doing things, ways of thinking about things, and uh, they need to be measured individually and then maybe combined in a weighted uh, indicator for uh, management executive dashboards. Yeah, I think I think one of the key things on, especially that part of the question was, uh, what company, uh, and I'm going to also add in government agency or nonprofit, has the best or better strategy. I think in this day and age, because of the uh, improvements in technology capability and accessibility, most companies have will to survive, especially the for-profit, will have to master the art of making a lot of mid-course corrections very dynamically. Uh, because of that change in technology, you know, you're know, you seeing uh, things like the old stalwarts of high-tech companies like Amazon, Apple, uh, even Google, uh, and then also on the government side, I was very impressed last year when I saw the entire Dubai city uh, ca uh, capabilities that were being introduced. Those things are all technology driven. So the companies that are playing a, a niche role today could get crowded out very quickly uh, just by a simple change in some base or foundation technology, which they were capitalizing on it on in January, but now has been disrupted and made moot by December. And so I, I, there's a number of companies that come to mind that can do this dynamic. I call it the dynamic two-step dance, uh, but they have to do it in two steps, three steps, and four steps uh, to stay ahead of uh, what transpires in the technology, which drives a lot of their innovative-driven services and products. Howard? I think that's, uh, that's it for me. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we had very good attendance. I uh, hope to uh, see you in Dubai. And uh, this is an exciting topic, and we'll uh, share some more. We we did a previous webinar on strategy execution. That, that went into more depth on that. And uh, that should be available uh, through Informa or through our uh, website for those of you who are interested in more of a deep dive on the uh, strategy execution side. Very much. Uh, thank you. Again, uh, echoing what Howard said, thank you very much. Um, both Howard and I are on LinkedIn, so if uh, you need to contact us or you don't have a direct email contact, you can uh, hit us up through uh, LinkedIn. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you in Dubai in May. Ryan, back to you.